Welcome everyone to the Evo Institute for Jewish Research virtually. My name is Alex Weiser. I'm the Director of Public Programs of YIVO. We're so pleased to have you here with us today for the Letters Project, A Daughter's Journey with Eleanor Risa and Sandy Bravarsky. Before we get started, just a brief word on YIVO. YIVO is a very special place for the celebration and cultivation of Jewish history and Jewish culture. We have a library and archive with over 23 million documents and over 400,000 books, and we make them available to researchers from around the world. We also have a variety of public programs like this, classes in Yiddish language, um, culture, history, and literature, and we have exhibitions to try to bring the world of our collections alive. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce Elna Raisa and Sandra Bravarsky. Elna Raisa is a Tony-nominated director, a Broadway and television actress, a prize-winning playwright, a former artistic director of the world's oldest Yiddish theater, and a singer in every major venue in New York City and in festivals around the world. Sandy Bravarsky is an award-winning journalist, editor, and the author of several books, most recently, 212 Views of Central Park, Experiencing New York City's Jewel from Every Angle with photographer Mick Hales. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Alex. Great to be here. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm really pleased to be here with Eleanor Risa. I'm sure that many of you know her from the performing arts. As you've heard, she's a talented actor, singer, impresario, playwright, translator, choreographer, and director. Um, I'm a big fan. And now she's written a really extraordinary memoir, The Letters Project, A Daughter's Journey. So as the longtime culture editor of the Jewish Week, I continue to receive a steady stream of Holocaust-related memoirs written by survivors, by their children and grandchildren, and now um, a lot of grandchildren are writing. Each one is memorable and important, but Eleanor's book really stands out for its urgency, immediacy, originality, heartbreak, beautiful prose, and even some humor. So it's a bit of a challenge to talk about the book because I don't wanna give away too much of it. And one of the pleasures of reading is that she carries the reader along in a way that you learn things about her family, just as she does. So the format is that um, I'm going to briefly introduce Eleanor, and then we're going to have a conversation about the book and other things, and we'll leave time for your questions, which you can send us through the Q&A. I've interviewed Eleanor many times over the years, but I guess this is the first time we're doing it with an audience. <laughs> So I think you've heard this, but I will, it's always good to hear it again. So briefly, Eleanor Risa was born in Brooklyn, New York. She has acted in film, television, and on Broadway. She was nominated for a Tony for directing Those Were the Days on Broadway. She's equally comfortable in Yiddish and English and has performed everywhere. She's a former artistic director of the Folksbina. She now, um, travels um, and performs with Frank London's Klezmer All-Stars and Paul Shapiro's Ribs and Brisket Review. She's the host of the Yale University Fortunoff Archive podcast, Those Who Were There, Voices of the Holocaust. Her first book is a collection, The Last Survivor and Other Modern Jewish Plays. She joins us from her home in Putnam County. So welcome, Eleanor. It's Gosh. really good to see you. Thank you, Sandy. It's really, really, really glad to be here. So I feel like we, before we get to the book, we have to go back a little bit and um, back to Brooklyn. So I wonder if you could just tell us a bit about um, your early life and growing up. Um, well, it was indeed in Brooklyn. And uh, my family, when they came from Poland, uh, when they came from Germany, at different times, my mother in 1949, my father in 1950, they lived in East New York in Brooklyn, and that's where I was born. And uh, East New York is a kind of, um, it was a upper, lower class, working class neighborhood or a lower middle class working class neighborhood. And um, I went to public school there. The neighborhood was multi-ethnic, multi-racial, uh, many Grine survivor, uh, immigrant, Jewish immigrant folks, 
as well as uh, Puerto Rican people, Black people, Italian and immigrant Italian people. It was, for me, it was great. Um, I, I was a latchkey kid. My mother uh, worked in a sweatshop, and my father also, but they divorced when I was uh, sometime between six and a little later than that. Um, and it, I hung out in streets and schoolyards playing with other kids. Um, I loved school. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, 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 I was in public school from K through Brooklyn College. I went to Tilden High School. Somehow in Brooklyn, the name of your high school identifies so many things. Your economic situation as well as, well, at least your economic situation. So I went to Tilden. I was a twirler. Uh, that was big for me to be a, a twirler because, I, I mean, I saw myself in a way uh, then too as other and the fact that I could make it onto the Tilden twirlers was, was, was a really big deal for me. So. So you went on from the twirlers to have a really remarkable career, which we're going to come back to. But um, you've told me that like whenever you're on stage or doing anything, you know, your parents, your family is with you. Um, do you still feel that? Even more so now. I mean, since the book, since the book, I mean, the book is like, I'm like a Holocaust all the time. It's a little dull in a way. Um, but I, I, however much I felt them before, holy cannoli, I certainly feel them much more now. Um, and, but all that being said, and kind of without making a light of it, when I speak Yiddish or sing or it's, you know, anything, they're so not far away. I mean, they're so close and, you know, waking up, going to sleep as need be, I do call upon them. Mm -hmm. So um, again, before we get to the book, let's take, this is a good moment to look at some photographs. Um, oh. Let's take a look and if you would just narrate us through them. So. Well, this, this, oh, this is the cover of my book. Those are Beautiful my book. cover. Thank you so much. It was done by Bob Stern. Um, you can kind of see the letters a letter in the background of their photo. And this photo was taken, I think, in 1947 in Ulm. Um, and that's my mother, Ruhale, and my father, Chaskel. They were just wooing at that time. And that, this is a an iconic photo from my life of always looking at it. You can see the date, 1949. And this was taken in Ulm. Uh, my father had uh, got, my father went to Stuttgart in 1918. He was born in Szczyzew, Poland in 1901. But he went to make his way in the world in Stuttgart. And it was from Stuttgart, which is only an hour away from Ulm. But in Stuttgart, he, it, he was married to someone else. He had a family. He then went to Auschwitz and was on the death march and from the death march eventually he found his way back to stuttgart he he i believe loved stuttgart uh and my mother uh who he didn't know at that time you know before the war um with her family was in fergana in uzbekistan and they in 1945 1946 found their way to this displaced persons camp in Ulm. Uh, and that's where, and my parents were cousins, um, not first cousins, but pretty, pretty close, pretty close to first, like second. Um, and because uh, they both came from a long line of mishpuche, of relatives. There were, my father's family had seven or eight children. My mother's mother, who is, who is related to my father, 
was also five, six, seven children more. Anyway, so this, they used to do these shots, these kind of- I love of, the way he's holding her in his hand. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, so, I mean, I do them now and you can, they're really fun to do. You can sort of, you know, you can, you know, you can find your, <laughs> you can make, make that wherever you like. Anyway, that's all them and, and that's them. And Let's take a look at the next one. Sure. Um, this is a photo. I don't know the year, but I it it must be before World War One. Is my I I don't know. I, I take that back. I have no idea exactly when this was, but the two the man with the beard and the woman in the back. That's my father's parents. Uh, the woman is Alterisha. I'm named after her. Uh, the man is. Uh, Nasano, my father's father, and the other two men are two of my father's brothers. I don't know uh, who the young boy is or the older young boy and the cow. <laughs> I, I, I'm told I'm told they did well. I'm told they that my grandparents uh, had a nice had a business and a, a, a stuff like that. So. This is my father, probably in either nine, in like 1929 or so, with his first wife, Chana. Uh, her name was Ruben, uh, her, her born name. And I mean, th this photo is to me is somewhat shocking in its beauty and attention to what they're both wearing. I mean, you can't probably, I don't know if you can see the top hat that's resting just behind the gloves that my father is holding uh, and and her train and her beautiful and white tie. And I'm I, so, I mean, in America, my father was a sweatshop worker and uh, this was something that I never knew about him his attention to, and here's another photo, which I didn't know about until I went to Germany, uh, but also 1920s, early 20s. And uh, I mean, my father was a bit of a clothes horse, which I had no idea about because when I knew him, he was not, yeah. Uh, you know, this comes back, that's me. Um, and, uh, my brother Seymour on the, on the, on one side and my beautiful mother on the other, uh, this in Brooklyn in East New York, uh, probably in 1953. She's beautiful. She's Thank beautiful. you. So, um, the story behind the book, um, begins with a pack of these handwritten letters that, that date back to 1949. Um, the letters turn out to be um, a kind of message from beyond. Um, I wonder if you can tell us about the letters and you didn't really find them. You had them for a while. Um. <laughs> I mean, my mother died in 1986. Uh, my father died in 1976 and they were divorced in, you know, I mean, I don't know the exact date, but let's say 1960 or something like that. So she kept her ex-husband's letters. She kept them, I mean, period, uh, from, from 1949. She kept them when, through their divorce, through this apartment and that apartment, through um, his death in 1976, and never, ever told me that in that drawer were 56 letters written by my father to her. So I did find them after she died uh, in 1986. They looked to be written in German, which kind of confused the heck out of me because my mother spoke Russian and Polish and English and Yiddish all fluently. I never ever heard her speak in German. So I knew my father spoke German, but he also spoke Yiddish. 
uh, so I didn't really understand. I didn't understand. I, it, and the salutation was written in Yiddish. Tayer uh, Ruchale and Shamala, dear Ruchale and Shamala, my brother. So um, I, I, I would look at them, Sandy, like every once in a while. You know, I'd unwrap, take them out of this baggie, but they were like a legal sized paper. There was writing on both sides of every page, all over, around, on the corners, and everywhere. I showed them to a couple of people. I, 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 I didn't know what to make of them, really, and I just put them away. And it was not until 2017, 18, 2018, when um, I got this job on Broadway to uh, do Indecent, uh, Paula Vogel's uh, and Rebecca Tashman's play, that I decided that it was maybe time to have them translated. And it took me 30 years. Um, and I understand that now. I do actually. I didn't. I just. I just didn't. I, I, you know, I just left them hanging around and didn't pay attention to them. So I did now, and uh, that the book it takes off because of these letters. So the letters. There are just like so many interesting coincidences, which maybe, you know, hardly seem like coincidences at all. There are maybe coincidences waiting to be happen. Have the, um, you know, you're someone who you hire to translate, who's the girlfriend of uh, someone you sing with, discovers that the address is right around the corner from her brother. Um, you keep meeting people like, how do you explain how these things happen and how this then unfolds into an amazing story? I, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know how you explain coincidences like so many. My, my editor uh, said that it was obviously uh, the work of from, from above. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I can't explain it except sometimes also, I think Stephen Greenblatt has a book called The Swerve. And in it, the it, atoms all move and if you're on the right atomic plane, you move with the atoms in the same direction. And uh, that's that's like what happened. So tell us about how, how you, where did you travel to? What, um, how did you come up with this route? Well, I mean, uh, my translator, uh, Yeva Lapsker, um, Frank, Frank London and I were doing a gig in Berlin uh, and that's where Yeva lived, and I was gonna see her there. We had to exchange more letters and and stuff. And um, she mentioned that her brother lived around the corner in Stuttgart from my father's address that was on his letterhead. And she asked me if I wanted to. She said she was going in January. This was in November, and she asked me if I wanted to go. And uh, I, 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 I had never thought about going. I had never thought there was any reason to go to Stuttgart or to Ulm, an hour away by train where my mother was. Uh, it, I mean, uh, I was content or maybe not content, but I didn't dig any deeper than what I knew. Um, fairly ignorant. I relied on uh, whatever I learned sitting at the table with my family, whatever I learned looking at photographs of who was missing or who was not missing. And I just figured I knew enough. Shockingly, I knew so little and I figured I knew enough. Um, but I also f didn't believe or didn't know there was anything more to find out, which is in this age of internet and stuff, I didn't think that was included. I didn't think the past, the, the Holocaust past was included, but I, indeed I was wrong. And uh, so Yeva offered me this opportunity to go with, she would leave early instead of visiting her brother on this day, she would visit him three days, uh, she would stay with me three days before. And then, so, so I wound up, wait, sorry. So 
in the meantime, when I still didn't know, should I go? Shouldn't I go? Why should I go? I got a call from a, a friend of mine, Evan Fallenberg, who is a writer in Israel who had recently bought this hotel, Arabesque, and wanted to turn it into an artist writer's residency for a couple of weeks a year. And exactly at this time, he called me and he said, hey, you know, a hotel's doing good. Uh, we're going to open it up for two weeks. Do you want to, are you working on anything, he says. And when is it, I ask him, and it turns out to be two days after Yeva leaves me in Germany. So it seemed like I had to do that. And so the where I went was to Germany and then to Israel, where I stayed for two weeks. In Germany, I was only there for uh, basically from Monday, <laughs> for four days. I was there for four days and uncovered the earth. So they're incredibly packed days. Each day seems like, you know, a week or two. But tell us about like some of the archives that you visited and the kind of files that you found there. So the archives, I mean, I, I'm a pretty instinctual kind of artist. And um, I'm, I'm not a great researcher. I'm pretty disorganized. So it was Yeva, uh, in one case, who, uh, when she knew we were going to Ulm, and before we got together, she contacted the, the Ulm archive and gave them my parents' names, their places of birth, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, their names and dates of birth and places of birth. And that was the first archive that we went to. Um, and and they, they were really interested in the photographs that I had. They were particularly interested in that photograph uh, of my mother in my father's hand. And um, they offered to do some research in 24 hours and see what they could find. And um, on the, and, and, and what they found were a, a lot of links to my father's name, uh, to my mother's last name in an archive place in Ludwigsburg, uh, which is near Stuttgart, which is mentioned many times in my letters, in my father's letters, which is a town I never heard of even, but it's a county seat kind of, and they have a massive archive there, uh, Staatsarchiv in Ludwigsburg. And so we went there, but also, and there, there we found, and, and this lovely fellow in, at the Ulm, archive gave us links upon links to tell the librarians in Ludwigsburg what we what we were looking for and they were kind enough to when we got there that's that same day that was day two uh we got to Ludwigsburg before they closed and for with a stack they presented us with a stack of files uh, with my father's name on a number of files, with his brother's name on a number of files, with his wife, Hannah's name, with his daughter, I learned, I mean, I knew he had a daughter, but uh, I didn't know about her, any, I didn't know anything about her except that she'd been killed. Um, and they had a file on her. I mean, she was, she was five and they had a file on her. Uh, but also, uh, when I was in Berlin before, uh, Frank's uh, friend and booking agent, uh, this fellow named Lutz, when he heard about the story, he said, you know, I know people in Stuttgart and Ludwigsburg, and I will connect you with them. And he did. And, uh, and there, uh, a fellow named uh, Hans Dieter Huber gave me an itinerary, was willing to show me around Stuttgart for the Wednesday and Thursday, uh, another, and, and he, in his investigation, found testimony that my father had given the 
basically the uh, the Department of per Prosecution of the persecutors, it, 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 like the Justice Department, basically the Justice Department to prosecute not former Nazis. Uh, and this organization was interested, they knew who the big Nazis were and they were interested in the local Nazis and the postman and the grocery guy and the butcher, the baker Nazis. And this fellow Hans Dieter Huber had done his little investigative work and between Yeva and uh, Hans, I had a, a full uh, itinerary and- But it was almost like, I mean, all these papers were just sitting there almost waiting for you to uncover them and here you are, but they're, it's all in German. You're reading it through a translator. You have very little time. What was all of that like for you? It was hard. <laughs> I mean, how do you go, you know, how do you, hundreds of pages hundreds of pages and and still to this day really sandy i mean there are un, un, untranslated documents that i have in my computer um because yeva had suggested that we make get links you know get links to these documents and we only could deal with so many and and um it it was I mean, how do you go past a page that says stuff about the yellow star or your father's concentration camp number? Or I mean, how do you not just sort of sit with that with your head in your hand and, you know, just weep for a couple of hours? But we were like, you know, okay, good. What's that say? And, you know, she would have to translate it and the, and, and they were not, uh, they were complicated documents and and um it was you know in the book i say it was a little bit like our own nazi selection you know we'll keep this one we won't keep this one we keep you know and how how we were deciding that you know we tried to use our instincts and our impulses um I, on one hand it was quite thrilling it, it you know, on one hand, it was very thrilling. And on another hand, in, in the greater hand, it was horrifying. And but it was like, also like finding pieces of a puzzle. That's, that's really also what this was, was, you know, stuff was falling down, it was like, stuff was falling down from the ceiling, uh, all these pieces. And, and so that's, and it took a while before a number of those uh, papers were ultimately translated. It was a long process. So I guess maybe it's a day later or so. This again, this nice fellow organizes a dinner for you um, to meet people. And one of the people there, which I think was your idea, which is really creative to have a um, costume designer come and take a look at the photos and maybe give you some other clues. Can you talk about that, that person? All of these characters are so well um, developed in some ways, you know, so the book actually ends up reading almost like a novel. There's the reporter, the translator, the costume designer, um, all these really helpful people. They were, they were so helpful. It, you know, I didn't, as I say, I'm not a good researcher, but, but what I did know, uh, so uh, Hardy, Hans D. Tahuba, uh, at one point, you know, he presented me with an itinerary, uh, including having a reporter follow me around, which I cavalierly agreed to, um, because you know, as you know, I'm I, I'm happy for press without really thinking that I might not really want press with me at this time. That it was not really a moment for press. That it was a little more important and or precious and or dark than, you know, a, 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 a blurb about Eleanor Reese's trip to Germany. Um, so, uh, but at one point, uh, Hans says to me, well, it, you know, he, after he presents me with this thing, he asks, is there anything that you would like to do? And as I mentioned, not being particularly 
research savvy, what I, and I had these photos of my father clearly before the war, clearly from a time when he was a young man, I didn't, they didn't have dates on them. I didn't know when it was from. And I said to uh, Hans, I asked him if there was a costume designer, uh, either film or, or theater that I might meet with to show them these photos. Cause I know from my theater experience and directing and working with costume designers that they know everything. I mean, they, they know when some, what, what this clothing means, what the collar means, what the fabric means, what year it was, uh, what year it's from, how upper class, lower class, debonair, uh, casual, they know all that stuff from looking at a photo. And, and this fellow, Hans, had me meet a costume designer at, uh, in Stuttgart at a terrific theater company called uh, Teata House. And she told me about my family based on what they were wearing. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, so, so the trip had all these different aspects to it. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Eleanor, one of the themes in a lot of your plays is about, you know, the dead coming back to life. Um, and you mentioned that several times in the memoir. Was that something that was that you were thinking about that was present for you as you were traveling, being in the very places where they had stood? Um, it was. I mean, uh, I mean, look. I was looking for them for starters. I mean, part of the reason that I wanted to take this trip, I mean, they're dead for a long time, practically, you know, except for my two brothers and I have an aunt and some cousins, everybody has been gone for a really long time. And I mean, I, I work in the theater, I have an imagination and I, believe in something and I guess I believe in atoms is what I think I believe in uh, but all that is to say Sandy sorry um, I felt like I did find them there I mean I find them here too I mean I you know I wherever I am I guess is where they are um, but when I went to the DP camp in Ulm and went inside and this DP camp I had heard about my whole life and here it was still standing. That was already, I mean, like, really? Why didn't I think of that before? Why didn't I think, well, why don't you go to Ulm and go to the DP camp? You don't, you know, but I didn't. And standing in the hallway of that camp where my parents lived in a room, not my parents, my mother and her son and her brothers and her parents, I just thought I I can feel them here, and there was a also a kind of collective grave site or a, a tombstone rather that I fell upon, uh, uh, that uh, remnant of Maya Lin's Vietnam Memorial, and and I find something there. And I felt they were everywhere. I, I did, I did, I did. And how it was to feel that it was really on one hand, extraordinarily sad to be with the dead and walk with the dead and stuff like that. But on the other hand, it was like, oh my God, I'm with them. I'm with them. They're here, isn't that? great i'm here they're here um and you also come away with like kind of a different understanding or maybe appreciation of your father <laughs> yeah um, mm. listen my father uh, my parents you know so they divorced or separated when i was five or seven and then i just saw him on sundays and he was uh, you know, he was, a. Uh, I, I thought very, I don't, I did not, 
I did not know who he was. Let's put it that way. I, I, I knew him in the time that, in the short time that I knew him, in the 23 years, I knew him as a grina, as a factory sweatshop worker who couldn't speak English, who had false teeth, who was inarticulate, uh, illiterate, which he was not. And, and that was my father. Um, and so on this trip, I learned who my, that, my, that that was not my father. That was my father after he was broken. And uh, before he was broken, he was, uh, I mean, you know, a handsome, bright, the, the costume designer in the, in the theater, you know, I think she said close. She said, "What is it? A clothes horse? Is, is that the? I, there's a word, and it might be clothes horse, but that's what she meant. Or maybe that's you know. I don't remember the book. My, hardly. I've only read it nine thousand times, <laughs> uh, and uh, and there's still typos. You know what I mean? It's like, um, but, um, yeah, I didn't know who he was. But but that is a bit of a takeaway in a way." how do you know who anybody is? And when, what you know about uh, your parents or you just know them from that moment, from, from the moment that you knew them, they had decades of life before they had you or me, as the case may be. Mm -hmm. So um, about humor, you know, there's just a lot in your descriptions through this book. There are some, you know, tragic moments and then there are points that are just kind of laugh out loud funny is is this your nature or did you feel this was you know the best way to tell this story well i mean it doesn't hurt you know it's a fine line sandy for me between irreverent and um making a joke or something and and sometimes i cross that line my impulse the irony of life uh, doesn't escape me too much. Um, and there were so many things about this journey that were ironic. Um, and as the daughter of someone who survived the Holocaust, rightly or wrongly, I somehow sometimes feel I'm entitled to say whatever I want which isn't really true. <laughs> I, mean, I'm, I mean, that's what I believed, but I try, you know, if I had to do again, I might be a little more politic. I might maybe not describe things in so, in a jokey way necessarily, but, but I, I think um, the only way I get through this is to see the irony of it and to make the joke. And if I can, I will. It's just, it's just so, biz it's, I mean, it's the depth as, as, as someone involved attached to the Holocaust in some way, how can you, you see the very best of humanity and you see the very worst of humanity. And so what the heck are you supposed to do with that information? Uh, if not get a laugh out of it every once in a while because it's so <clears throat> horrifyingly tragic. So you, I, I, that's where I live. Mm -hmm. so, um, <laughs> there's so much of the story that we haven't touched on, but again, I, I, I think, um, you know, we'll leave some of that for the readers, but I, the next sort of chapter of the book, then it shifts to Israel. You then, after spending these, you know, very, packed days in Germany, land in Israel. And I wonder how that inspires your telling of the story. Well, it changes, every, you know, the location changes everything. There was not one day in Germany that was not cold, gray and rainy. And, and the, the darkness of the discoveries was so intense um, that when I get to Israel, it's like, whoa. It, and so I got to see a little bit of family when I was there and then went to Akko, 
where I was going to be for the next two weeks in a beautiful hotel with two other artists. Um, so it definitely lightened the pall. But while I was there, the trans... So what what's a bit left out that we didn't say is that one of the things that Yeva found in Stuttgart was a 30 page and it was probably 30 plus page document a testimony that my father gave in germany in 1967 i think and that was a bit you know we found a lot of things but that was a kind of mother load of resources uh, in his own words who he was and what happened and so we couldn't, we had to, we couldn't translate that while we were in Germany. It was too much. So uh, I parsed it out to four or five different helpful, uh, not, not necessarily professional, but German speaking helpful translators who, as I was in Israel, were sending me back this page and this page and this page and this page of these 30 pages. So those 30 pages with whatever truths and not truths were in there of my father's testimony, which turn out to be reparation based, um, were re-intensified uh, the whole, uh, Reintensified and almost made the letters and everything we'd everything else we'd found in Germany secondary, um, and then I had some personal disappointments and and basically even though I was like in paradise, <laughs> I was knocked for a loop uh, again and more. But the good news was, you know, it was by the Mediterranean, and the sun was shining and the food was stupendous and the company was good so that's that's how that happened mm -hmm. so i think after reading those pages in translation and perhaps putting it all together um you know you and you describe your parents not as survivors of the show up but as fighters and i i wonder if you could that's really important if you could say more about that Uh, in my father's documents, it describes his time in Auschwitz and how he managed to not get killed, fortunately, how, how he, what he did in spite of all the beatings and things like, and starvation and cold, blah, blah, blah. And then he was on the death march and the hopelessness of that, yet the perseverance of, the, of, of him through that. And it struck, it struck me at some point through all of that knowledge that I learned, all of that information that I learned that, you know, always I used to think the fighters were who we thought of as in the far, the partisans. Those were the fighters. Everybody else was the victim or the survivor. And the fighters were the people with the guns in the forests and and I, after this, I have taken the position that everyone, whether they were successful and weren't murdered or not successful and were murdered, were fighters. That, and that they fought every single, from every child to every grown up, old person, cripple, they fought. These people fought to, to live, they fought for us, they fought to stay alive, and always, not always, but the term survivor to me was a bit of a minimizing term. And, and I feel like they are entitled to be fighters, that they fought like hell. And whether they were successful or not, whether they had a gun or a loaf of bread or a, a book 
or a, a paper that they stuffed it somewhere or whatever it was that they were fighters. And that's that I, 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 I'm, I, I'm the daughter of Holocaust fighters. Not, not, not. I, and I mean no insult, you know what I mean, to anyone who doesn't like that term or thinks whatever they think. This is just, this is just where I'm at about it. Okay. Thank you, Elena. I think that's, that's so important. I have so many more questions, but I'm going to shift um, for a few minutes to the many questions that people are sending in. So if someone is asking, when you call upon your deceased family, do you do that in Yiddish and they answer in Yiddish? If so, how do you feel language influences memory and hope? What a great question. <laughs> I do do it in Yiddish. I never speak to them in English, never. And and they don't answer me, Sandy. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? I am a little nuts, but I ain't that nuts. They don't answer me back in any language, really. Uh, it's only myself who answers me back. Um, but and I does do language it. influence a memory and hope? And sadness and connection. And it's another way to think. It's a different way to think in Yiddish. There are things in English that sound rude and coarse and whatever. And in Yiddish, you kind of can get away with it because it doesn't really sound that bad. It's sort of, it has a kind of folksy quality. And, uh, you know, it's gotten me in trouble also more than once, but um, I do think it matters. And I think if you have an opportunity to reinvigorate your language skills in Yiddish, you should do so. Mm -hmm. Um, someone else asking whether you're planning to get more of the documents translated that haven't yet been, or do you want, do you think, do you see yourself returning to those archives where the more papers exist? It's a really good question. I have to say that I feel like there are things that I said in the book and or didn't say in the book that I would like to re-examine. I've learned things. I've learned a lot of things since I wrote it. I mean, I wrote it two years ago and it's taken all this time or maybe not all, it's taken all this time to, 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 to be alive in the world. Uh, and I, I don't really wanna look at those documents anymore, I'll tell you that in a way, because I feel like I know, I don't wanna know anymore and I know enough, but that was how I felt before too, that I knew enough. Uh, so I don't know enough. I, I'd be curious to, to re-explore mm -hmm. now that I kind of have told one aspect of the story. Um, any plans to make this into theater, drama, reading, musical, <laughs> documentary? It seems like, especially with these characters, it seems like it would be a, a really great theater piece. You know, if wishes were attached to plans, I would, you know, I do wish I think it's a visual life as well. I think that this the, this story has a visual life, and I think, you know, that uh, you know whoever want you know Juliana Margulies as Eleanor Risa, or you know, I mean, we can cast it. And if anybody, you know, if anybody wants to help, I'm in the groove for that. But but it's it's a book. I, I, when I first thought of the letters and stuff like that, I thought it would be a, a play with three people, uh, a mother person, a father person, and a me person. But it's a greater story than that. And uh, so I, I, I'd like to see it if it were in another form as the greater story of a film or mini series. Um, thanks. Someone is asking if you've learned more about like the place that where your father was born yeah I, yeah i've yeah i mean a couple that year uh, the year that we were tr that i was translating the letters frank london and i did a concert in krakow uh for the Ju their jewish festival and shchizhov where my father was from is an hour or two hours away and i hired a, a, a tour guide a guide to take me to that town and that guide, you know, these people are so much more uh, investigative than I am. The guide who I never met and didn't know also, what's your father's name? What's his date of birth? Uh, and we found the report card 
There were report cards of my father and his siblings from 1907, 08, 09. I mean, there's stuff out there. If you look, I didn't know. Wow. There are a lot of Brooklyn questions, Eleanor. <laughs> what street in East New York did you grow up on? Hendricks between Blake and Dumont is the first place I lived. Then I went to PS 233. Then we moved to Rockaway Parkway across the street from what was Bethel Hospital between Church and Linden. And I went to PS 233. And then I went to junior high school on Linden Boulevard and Rockaway Avenue at Harry A. Eisman Junior High School. Uh, you know, and I, and I'll tell you, Sandy, I love, I, I, Brooklyn was a great, I mean, I'm sure it still is a great place. It, it, I mean, I, I don't go back that much, but um, yeah, that's, yeah, it was great. Um, how was writing this um, satisfying, perhaps in other ways than your other artistic endeavors? You know, my nature was to write a play and I've written a bunch of plays, but man, oh man, are plays hard to get produced. It's hard to get a kind of completion with a play. I mean, it, it, it's just hard. And a book is also hard, but it went better than the plays. And the book is currently alive and I, I, it's in the world um, and I, in a way, I'm sort of done-ish with it and now it lives on its own, uh, which I'm really fortunate about. And I, I do want to, you know, shout out to like my agent, Deborah Harris and my editor, Deborah Englander, and to you, Sandy, and all, there are people who have absolutely helped me so it's a rough it's a rough it's a rough you know it's rough it's rough out there <laughs> so thank you um so someone else that you mentioned is listening i see sam norwich is asking about whether you would plan like a family trip to go back to poland and whether there's a sequel sam norwich call me sam you owe me a phone call um a family trip. I mean, that was my family. That was my family trip. Actually, I mean, uh, sorry to be so, you know, I wouldn't mind taking a family trip if my, uh, I have a niece and a nephew and my niece has children. Um, I don't know if anybody would want to go. I, I, it's not anything I have in the works with regards to a sequel. There's, I mean, I, you know, there's other, I'm not done. I don't feel done. Let's put it that way. I definitely don't feel done. And there just aren't enough hours in the day. And the weird question that I ask myself is, once you've written about the Holocaust, can you write about anything else? I mean, what else, what else should I write about? You know, my love life? I mean, like, really? That's what you're going to write about? That's important. You know, I mean, I'm just, it's an odd, it's an odd, um, I don't want to say burden, but an odd uh, something. Um, someone is asking you if, if you know whether someone who has, you know, sort of similar history might be able to check some of these archival, archival documents, you know, online. Who also, and this person also adds, you are a mixed, magnificent writer. And I agree. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I mean, here, here I'm, I'm the model of if I could do it, anybody could do it. I mean, it's, yeah, yes, I didn't know I could do it. I know now I could do it. And, you know, and I didn't even, I mean, I didn't even really try. It's not, I didn't even, I, I, I didn't, I, there's more, I, I'm sure I got the tip of the iceberg, frankly. You know, it's just a question of how much you want to know. And especially, sorry, especially if your people or who, who are you looking into at, at, try to get reparations, I think, uh, or I, there's a lot of ways 
for for the cats to gain a better for the cat to go over the river or bridge, whatever the expression is. Sam, write write it in. Um, somebody's asking how you felt being in Germany, especially when you would see older people. I. I, I, when I see older people, I have a hard time. When I see older people, I have a hard time, but I, I commend the, I commend Germany because I feel like they have actually looked in the face of their own racism. And I feel like they, and, and fascism and they, They've kind of said, I'm sorry. Uh, and, uh, I, and I don't know another country that says or said they were sorry. I think most of the un other country says, said, what, me? We didn't do nothing. So, so, so anyway, I, 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 I don't, with older people or with people who I feel look at me and think, ugh, Jewish, you know, I'm sensitive to that, but, I don't have a problem in Germany anymore. So this is someone who's known you since PS 233, uh -oh. Ivy Sales. Um, Sales yeah. He says, you're such a talented person. What's your favorite form of expression? I love singing, especially especially now that I haven't done any. I mean, I, I it's been a little hard. Um, Frank and I have a live gig coming up in Hartford uh, at the end of this month, and we did a couple of a rooftop concert and we a garden con you know virtual concerts. I miss that a lot. Um, I really like writing. I really feel like I would like I I, I like writing. Um, yeah. So you have this nice encounter with the theater people in Stuttgart. Could you imagine going back there and performing? Yeah, it's one of those things again, Sandy. If imagination could make something happen, uh, they have they have this theater house in Stuttgart is a beautiful complex, a beautiful theater complex. And you know, I, if you want to talk about dream scenario, my play The Last Survivor would fit in there just right. Um, had a quick question. How do you spell the town your father was from? Yeah. S, uh, S sorry, I have to write it. S T Z R Z Y O W S T. I, I believe, I mean, I, you know, you have to buy the book if you want to know how to spell it. S T Z R Z Y O W something like that. Shjizhov, doesn't sound like that, but. Thanks, so I had one more question for you, which is that when I think of all of your work that you've done, and we've talked about this, the thing that seems to tie it all together is that you're a storyteller. Um, whether, you know, as a singer, actor, um, do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. I mean, you know, in my early days, in the entertainment or show business. And I started out <clears throat> as an actor uh, and then I moved to singing and then I moved to directing and then I moved to choreography and then I moved to writing. And it was like, people say, well, what do you do? What do you do? I mean, who, what are you? Are you an actor or are you a director or are, and this book, <laughs> taught me that I was a storyteller. I was a storyteller as an actress, a storyteller as a singer, uh, and all of the other things. And I wish I had known that. I wish I had known that there was a category and that I was not just some, you know, someone who thought, well, I'm an actress, but maybe I should learn how to sing so that I could get more work. No, I, I, I'd like to tell a story like that, with that tune, with this play, with that move, you know, yeah, I didn't know. I mean, I wish, you know, I wish I didn't, I wish I knew more when I was younger, uh, uh, period. 
So we, we all look forward to many, many more of your stories, Eleanor. So really, thank you so much for your candor, your eloquence, your generosity in sharing this really personal story. Um, I really recommend, here's the book jacket, that you all read it, buy it. You can get it in bookstores everywhere and also online. Um, and I think there's been a link in the chat. Um, I want to also thank Alex and Evo for hosting this. And um, I hope someday before too long, we'll be able to do this in person. And Ellen, one last thing someone is asking persistently about whether the book has been translated into Hebrew. No, 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 it hasn't. It has not yet. Not yet. Not not yet. yet. No, although I'm told that they won't want it in Hebrew, but maybe they will. So can I just also say thank you, Sandy, to you and to Alex and to everyone out there and to the people at YIVO. Uh, support YIVO, everybody. Okay, thank you. Stay well, everyone. Bye, thank you. Good day.